There is still time to correct this most grievous misunderstanding, Mr. Carter. The dagger of Amman Ra must be returned to Egypt. Stay out of my way, or I'll thrash you within an inch of your life. Surely you can find a way to accommodate everybody's wishes. Who are you to tell me what I can do with my own property? Your property? What authority do you have? The authority authority of the Egyptian Antiquities Service. So if you don't like it, I suggest you waddle on back to Egypt and complain to your own government. Would it not be better to work this out diplomatically? This isn't a case for diplomacy. It's a case for your acceptance of the situation. It is not just my acceptance at issue, Mr. Carter. Frankly, some of our people are quite upset. Move to take drastic measures if need be. Are you threatening me, you malodorous little man? Mr. Carter, there are some who would rather fight back than allow their country to be stripped of its national treasures. Any fat savage who lays a finger on my exhibit, or threatens me, will find himself in deep trouble. Do I make myself clear? As clear as the water of the oasis, Mr. Carter. Careful with that steamer trunk, young man. It's exceedingly valuable. It sure is heavy, Mr. Carrington. You got gold bars in here or something? The contents of my trunk are not your concern. Now be a good lad and take it to my taxi. The Countess is waiting. One week later. Are you sure you've got everything? Yes, Daddy. You've got Sam's address at the paper? Yes, Daddy. You've got the money I gave you? Yes, Daddy. Don't worry. Put some money in your shoe. New York's a big city, and there's a lot of crime there. Look, I'm going straight to the paper. What could possibly go wrong? Let me give you a little more money, just in case. Dad, I've got to go. Godspeed, Laura. Call me as soon as you get there. I'll be fine, Dad. I'm going to make you proud of me. I already am, honey.
Excuse me, dear, are you a secretary? Actually, I'm starting a new job as a reporter for the New York Daily Register News Tribune. My name's Laura Bow. How nice. I'm Ermgard. Is this your first trip to the big city? Am I that obvious? How could you tell? By the way you keep glancing out the window, dear. I did the same thing the first time I came to New York. The tall buildings, the people rushing around, it was all so exciting. Then I stepped off the train and got mugged. How awful! It's the New York experience. Thank you, dear. You're very kind. I've enjoyed traveling with you. Do you need any help getting home? No, dear. I'll be fine. Thank you. You're sure you'll be okay? Yes, thank you. Goodbye. Goodness gracious! My suitcase! Can you spare a dime, miss? Certainly, sir. I'm always ready to help those who are less fortunate. Well, that's just peachy. Give me all your money, then. Excuse me? Hand it over. This seems very unfair. Welcome to New York, kid. Gonna let a little bad luck ruin my day. Hello, New York. Laura Bow has arrived. Destiny awaits. Nothing can stop me now. I really want to thank you for hiring me, Mr. Augustini. For hiring you? I don't even know who you are. I'm Laura Bow. I believe you know my father, John Bow. Ah, John Bow's daughter. Now I remember. How is he? He's fine, and he says hello. He wanted to know if you still had that newspaper clipping on your wall about the explosion of the Hindenburg building in New Orleans. Yes, your father was the first cop on the scene of the explosion, and he let me into the wreckage so I could cover it for the paper. I rescued Rupert Hindenburg from his burning office, wrote about it, and made a name for myself as a reporter. I owe John a lot for that. Think you can handle being a reporter for a big city paper? I'll do my best, sir. We usually just hire men for this job. It's rough out there, and you're kind of small. I can do it, Mr. Augustini. Just give me a chance. All right, as a favor to my old pal John. But I'll be keeping a close eye on you. Thank you, sir. For your first assignment, I want you to write about a burglary. Some kind of uh, fancy knife was stolen from the Lion Decker Museum. I'll arrange for you to attend the fundraiser at 7 o'clock tonight for their new Egyptian exhibit. Everyone will be there. Tell them you're covering the society news so they won't clam up on you. You won't regret it, sir. I have a nose for news. Just keep your nose out of trouble. Here's your official notebook and your pencil. It already has Crodfaller's notes in it. Have the story ready by three tomorrow, or you're out of a job.
Laura Baines, right? Laura Bow, sir. And I believe you have the advantage. Crodfaller Rhubarb, ma'am. Though you can call me Rube. So I suppose you've already met Sam. Yes, he's very... colorful. Don't let him shake you. He's tough on the outside, but inside, he's got a heart of stone. I'm sure he... Pardon me? What did you say? Never mind. Just pulling your leg. Why don't you take this desk right here, and we'll get you settled in. That's very kind of you. Mr. Augustini sort of left me on my own. I have to start on this story about a burglary at the Lion Decker Museum. This is the city newsroom of the New York Daily Register News Tribune, New York City's second most popular newspaper. It's a beehive of activity, but as you look around the room, you notice with some dismay that all of the employees are male. This is now your desk. It's very old and looks like it hasn't been cleaned thoroughly in years, but it's sturdy and serviceable. It looks like an old desk blotter. You peel up a corner of the blotter to reveal a small key. You pick it up and place it in your purse. This is the top drawer of your desk. The desk drawer is locked. You unlock the drawer. Unfortunately, the key permanently jams itself in the lock. Let's hope you never want to lock this drawer again. A press pass. It reads, Press. Your pants while you wait. Low Fats Chinese Laundry, 5858 Broadway Avenue, New York. You pick it up and place it in your purse. It's the first pencil holder you've ever had as an official member of the Fourth Estate. You already have plenty of pencils. Crodfaller T. Rube Rhubarb is one of the Trib's top writers. Among other things, he's in charge of writing obituaries, yet he's also extremely cheerful. It's a waste paper basket conveniently situated next to the desk. You find a curiously heavy object in the trash. This baseball has been autographed by Bob Ruth, Babe's unknown younger brother. Bob never made it out of the minor leagues because he was incapable of violence and therefore would not harm a baseball by hitting it with a bat. Bob eventually quit baseball and became a successful psychiatrist. You pick it up and place it in your purse. I hope I'm not intruding. I mean, if you were working on the burglary story... Miss Bo, please, it is not a problem. Yes, I'd started work on the story, but it's not your fault that it's been reassigned. That's just something I'll have to take up with Sam. Thank you, Mr. Crod... I mean, Rube. It must be so thrilling to see your byline on a story. I rarely get a byline on my obituaries. I seem to be pigeonholed on the obit page. What can you tell me about Sam? He's a perfectionist. 
I badmouth him now and then, but, well, he's given me plenty of breaks, so I owe him a few. What can you tell me about this Pippin Carter character? A queer bird, if ever I've met one. Kind of comes across as cultured, yet he's a loudmouth, you know what I mean? He's got a chip on his shoulder the size of the Brooklyn Bridge. He'll try to cut you down, just shake it off. That's what I had to do. What should I know about Archibald Carrington? Carrington hasn't been in the States long. He's from England, but somehow he doesn't quite come off on a level. Call me stupid, but I just think the guy should be more concerned about museum property vanishing. His first month on the job, too. Have you dealt with Detective O'Reilly? I know he's assigned to the case. I didn't get anything out of him. Maybe you'll have better luck being a lady and all. Tell me about yourself, Mr. Rhubarb. What's to tell? I'm a reporter for this paper, probably since before you were born. But I want to know about the real Crodfaller T. Rhubarb. You mean there's another Crodfaller T. Rhubarb? No two sets of parents could be that cruel. That's okay, Mr. Crodfaller. You don't have to tell me about yourself if you don't want to. Rube. Who are you calling a... Oh, Rube's your nickname, isn't it? Sorry, I forgot. Tell me about Low Fat. The old laundry guy? What's to tell? Have you heard the name John Bow? Don't think so. He a relative of yours? He's my father. Oh, Sam's friend. Never met him, I'm afraid. Is there anything I should know about working here at the New York Daily Register News Tribune? Well, first of all, we call it the Trib. No need to use the whole name. I don't think anyone in New York even remembers the whole shebang. Second, don't worry about Sam. He's gruff and loud, but he's really a cream puff. Don't let him push you around. Lastly, don't get too attached to any one assignment. You never know when it'll be yanked away from you and given to some less experienced reporter with no qualifications except an in with the boss. Ahem. <clears throat> Sorry. Didn't mean to get peevish. Anything I should know about the police station? Well, it's usually a good source of information. It's standard procedure to check there at some point in any investigation. Sometimes they just blow smoke at you, you know, hand you the commissioner's party line. But once in a while, they'll give you something you can actually use. What can you tell me about low fat? It's a place to take your laundry. That's about it, as far as I know. Give me the lowdown on the 12th Street docks. Lowdown? You've been reading too much pulp fiction. The docks are the docks. 
Keep away from them unless you have business there. Is there anything I should know about the Lion Decker Museum? Yeah, I went down there. I did get that far in the investigation, at least. I met the museum's president, a stodgy old croaker named Archibald Carrington III. Cagey guy didn't seem overly concerned about the dagger. You might see if you can get a little bit more out of him. I also spoke with a Pippin Carter. Nasty little squirt. He acts like the world owes him a living. Apparently, he's the one who's originally discovered the dagger in Egypt, along with some of the other junk in the exhibit. Now, he was hot about the dagger. Took the whole thing like it was a personal stab at him. No pun intended. Now, what's the scoop on the flower shop? You mean the speakeasy? The flower shop's just a cover. Look for a fella there named of Ziggy. He knows a lot and tends to talk too much. Any advice for somebody who's brand new to the city? Well, keep your eyes off the tall buildings. That's how muggers spot you. Don't leave your luggage alone for a moment or somebody will walk off with it. And if you travel anywhere, be sure to put some money in your shoe, just in case. <sighs> Where can I find this speakeasy? Just ask any cab driver. They'll take you there. It's the place disguised as a flower shop. What should I do with this notebook? You're a reporter, for heaven's sake. Surely you know to take notes. But why does it have all these notes already in it? Because that was my notebook. And I was taking notes in it for the burglary investigation. It's your notebook now. And I don't care to discuss it anymore. This. I'm not sure. Hand it to me and I'll take a closer look at it. Oh, this is what we call a press pass. Very useful. We ran out of official press passes. This is a business card for low fats, but if you wave it in front of a cabbie, it'll take you where you want to go. this baseball in the trash. What should I do with it? Keep it, I guess, or give it away. The sports writer who sat at your desk only had about 50 souvenir baseballs. I have a feeling 1926 is going to be a great year, don't you? Yeah? You ever try writing obituaries for a living? Hardly a jolly way to spend the year. Were you able to get any leads at all about the burglary at the museum? No, nope. hadn't been working on the story very long. I went to see Detective O'Reilly down at the police station, but he was pretty tight-lipped. I was planning on talking to Ziggy down at the speakeasy. He's a stoolie, usually good for a tidbit or two. Any other leads I can follow up on? 
With due respect, ma'am, it's going to be your byline on the story, not mine. Point taken, Mr. Crod for... Rube. Any wisdom you'd care to pass along about Egyptology? You've already proven to me you know as much about Egyptology as I do. Maybe more. I bow to your superior knowledge, Miss Bow. Thank you, sir. One notice reads, when covering formal events such as embassy parties, please dress appropriately. We've had complaints about reporters who refuse to dress properly at social events. One of the notices reads, some of our employees have been asking for a 40-hour work week, as has been proposed by Mr. Henry Ford. This is not an automobile factory, this is a newspaper. News happens 24 hours a day, and we need to report it. One of the notices reads, Stolen, one Victrola, reward offered, no retribution will be exacted. One of the notices reads, Dr. Darwin DeLoring will be hosting a symposium, Jazz, the Charleston, and other sins of our times, to be held in the cafeteria next Tuesday, all repentant souls are invited to attend. This is the science editor for the Trib. His latest report critiqued Goddard's demonstration of the first liquid fuel rocket which traveled 184 feet in 2.5 seconds. At the moment he's checking to see who signed up for the three-legged race at the annual picnic. So excited to be a member of the Trib staff. After all, I studied journalism in college. I went to Tulane and never thought that my first job out of school would be at a paper as prestigious as this one. I mean, that is unusual, isn't it? I'm sorry, were you talking to me? Never mind. It is better to know some of the questions than all of the answers. James Thurber The gent's sign leaves little doubt as to what lies behind the door. You shudder to think of it. You can't go in there. That's the men's lounge. You glance around curiously but there's no sign of a ladies' lounge. This is patently unfair. The man poring over a layout is Eddie Bedletter, creator of the syndicated advice column Dear Eddie. Unfortunately, Eddie has been divorced twice and is estranged from his rival columnist brother, so where he gets off giving other people advice on how to live their lives is an unanswerable question. Aren't you Eddie Bedletter, the syndicated columnist? I'm a great fan of yours, and I've read... Yeah, yeah. I'm busy right now. I'm busy right now, girlie. Love to help you out sometime, though. Maybe buy you dinner or something. The New York home for the mentally bewildered. A woody perennial plant with one main stem or trunk which develops many branches, usually at some height above the ground, otherwise known as a tree. A sign with the word taxi printed on it. This could have numerous meanings. 
However, since it does not look like a taxi itself, it probably just means that taxis will stop here if summoned. It's the world-famous product design building. The imposing Gothic entrance to the world-famous New York Daily Register News Tribune. The corner of 75th Street and Madison Avenue, New York City, home of the world-famous New York Daily Register News Tribune building, among other things. It's a car. There are no cars coming from this direction. There are no cars coming from this direction. Exterior. A man sleeping under a newspaper. Judging by the strong smell of alcohol, you deem it wise not to light a match in his presence. Excuse me, sir. Sleeping. He's out cold, but he has a tight grip on his newspaper. The entrance to the police station. Sergeant Dennis O'Flaherty is the desk sergeant on duty today. He's shuffling papers, putting on a good show of looking busy while his mind is elsewhere. Pardon me. I'm looking for some information. Well, take yourself down to the library then. Pardon me, sergeant, but I happen to be a reporter with the Trib. Oh, well, strike up the barn then. Look, Lassie, I've been out with my dogs all day, and I haven't had my lunch. And i got a better things to do than to jaw with some slip of a girl reporter. Go on with you now. Excuse me, but I really need some information. The desk sergeant ignores you, though his stomach growls impatiently. This support column is also a handy place for posting notices and announcements. Please remember, as of June 15, 1924, all Indians are now full citizens of the USA. Please respect their rights and privileges. Thank you. Let's be careful out there. Why wait? 
There's never been a better time to invest in the stock market. Civil servants qualify for discount brokerage services at H.R. Schwab, Mary Hill, 3173. Invest in the future of America today. Tickets to the Policeman's Ball now available. Contact Officer Friendly. Needed. Volunteer with aeronautic training. Opportunity for co-pilot on first transatlantic flight, Roosevelt Field to Paris, next spring. Contact C. Lindbergh, Hamilton 6656. Wanted by FBI, Al Capone. Approach with caution. Contact FBI for details. Look, miss, I'm not in the mood to answer any reporter's questions. The door to a private office. The paper is full of old news and a valuable coupon. A coupon for a free sandwich from Luigi. You pick it up and place it in your purse. There are no cars coming from this direction. There are no cars coming from this direction. A man selling corned beef sandwiches from a cart. At the corned beef, get you hot a corned beef sandwich. Is that corned beef lean? Lean a corned beef? This is the leanest corned beef in the city. Maybe in the country. So lean the cow, she keep on tipping over. You wanna buy a corned beef sandwich, lady? I believe I would like a sandwich. Mamma mia, another coupon. I'm a gonna go broke. What a crummy idea I had. That's uh, the last time I advertised in a newspaper. Take your sandwich and get out of here before I change my mind. You pick it up and place it in your purse. There are no cars coming from this direction. There are no cars coming from this direction.
look so hungry. Here, take this. Children, this is going to be a sandwich on rye. Bless you, lassie. Don't mind if I do. Children, it tastes fresh, too. Mmm. I know I always feel a little better after I've had something to eat. There's no denying that, miss. Now what was it you were wanting to ask me? Is there any information you can give me about Sam Augustini, editor of the New York Daily Register News Tribune? Hoot man, he's a good law-abiding citizen. Do you know anything about a Detective O'Reilly? I should hope to tell, miss. What does him being the detective on duty here today? His office is right over there if you want him to talk to him. I'm looking for information about a man named Ziggy. What would a lass like yourself be wanting with scum like that? Never you mind why. I'm just looking for information about him. I suppose it's no big secret. Not around here, anyways. Ziggy's is a first-class little rat fink. Couldn't cut it as a crook on his own. Now he has to go around spoiling it for the rest of them. Nasty little big mouth. Though he does seem to hear an awful lot. If you're looking for him, he's the kind of man what hangs around in speakeasies. Not that we have any New York City, mind you. We've got these places closed up good and tight. What can you tell me about this police station? 14th Precinct, miss, and a darn fine precinct she is, too. What should I know about the 12th Street Docks? Oh, lovely place if you like rats, thieves, and roughnecks. If I were you, I'd be staying away from that area. Lord knows we do. What do you know about the Lion Decker Museum? A very fun establishment. Worthwhile seeing, even if you're only in town for a short while. Very educational. Have you actually been there? Well... But I live in the city, and I'm not having to see all the landmarks. What should I know about New York? I've only just moved here. Best advice I can offer you, miss, is to keep some money in your shoe at all times. You never know when you might need some emergency cash. What can you tell me about the speakeasy? Now I don't know anything about a speakeasy. Not in this town. We run a clean city here. But there are some nice places where a lady like yourself can sit and relax and enjoy a bit of the high life, if you know what I'm saying. Of course, some of these places are restricted, don't you know? So you'll have to be giving them the right signs so they know you're okay. But just mention a Charleston, and you're in like Flynn. You got that now? I think so. Thank you kindly, Sergeant. Don't mention it. And I mean it now. Don't you go mentioning it. Not to anyone. What does 1926 mean to you? A uh, cut in the department's budget and another year of haggis and blood pudding. No one's just sorry you asked.
What can you tell me about the burglary at the Lion Decca Museum? I'm not covering that case, miss. Why not ask Detective O'Reilly about it? He's the one you should be talking to. What's this business about the Charleston? It's a popular dance last. It's also the you-know-what for the you-know-what I told you about earlier. The door to a private office. You knock politely. You hear the muffled response. Come in. Sure and Bigora, I'm Detective O'Reilly. What would you be wanting then, lass? I'm Laura Bow from the New York Daily Register News Tribune. I'm looking into the burglary at the Lion Decker Museum, and I understand you're handling the case. Would it be possible for me to look at your report? You can't be a reporter, lass. You're a girl. The Trib only hires men. I am a reporter, sir. And you can check with my editor, Sam Augustini, if you don't believe me. I thought that Crodfeather guy was going to be writing the robbery article. Crodfather was assigned to it, but the story is mine now. Can I see that report, please? It's very technical, lass. I don't think you'll be learning much from it. Thank you for your concern, detective, but I'd like to be the judge of that. You're a determined girl. I'll say that much for you. Have a look, then. The file on the Lion Decker Museum burglary is nothing more than a single handwritten page. It mentions only one stolen object. The Dagger of Amon Ra. The burglar or burglars left no fingerprints or other clues. Their method of access to the museum is unknown. In summary, the police are baffled about the burglary at the museum at this point. Some parts of the report seem vague. The report is signed by Detective Ryan Hanrahan O'Reilly. There's only one page to this report. Where's the rest of it? That's all of it right now. It's rather vague, isn't it? Good police work takes time, and I'm a very busy man. I haven't had time to follow up on the burglary. So what if a museum loses a knife? There are people being murdered left and right in this city, dropping like flies. Cars are being stolen, booze is being smuggled into speakeasies. Pedestrians are being mugged, firebugs are burning down half the city, they're running out of grapes at the corner market, and I've got a headache. And you know who gets to investigate all the crimes in this district? Me! So I don't need any nosy reporters hanging around telling me my reports are vague, girly. Well, excuse me. Talk to the desk, Sergeant, if you have any more questions. I haven't got time for you right now. Greetings, madam. I can motivate you to your destination if you can prove that you're a reporter or if you have American currency. The driver is a big, rough-looking guy with a broken nose. Whatever you do, don't touch him. It reads, Taxi Operator's License, New York Taxi Control Authority. The bottom of the license reads, License renewed September 5, 1926. The driver's name is Rocco. 
I'm terribly sorry, madam, but the taxi control board doesn't allow me to hold long discussions with passengers except at my own discretion. To what location would you like to be motivated, madam? Have you read that new book by Carl Sandburg? It's Abraham Lincoln, The Prairie Years. Actually, it's the first two volumes of a six-volume biography, and I find it quite stimulating reading. Thanks for traveling with us, madam. Have a pleasant day. Hi. The stevedore looks a little more refined than you'd expect. He's also rather attractive. Good morning, miss. I'm Steve Dorian. I'm Laura Bow. Boy, do I remember that guy. He supervised the unloading of the Egyptian crates from the ship. It was a bunch of stuff for the museum, and he was real protective about it. Mr. Carrington came in on the Andrea Doria. I remember because he had the heaviest steamer trunk I've ever lifted. And it smelled funny, too. Gave me a big tip. Then that rich lady picked him up in a taxi. He called her the Countess Waldorf Carlton. He's some kind of a cheap hood. He used to hang around here sometimes. That's where Mr. Carter's Egyptian crates were going. Nice place. Ever been there? Actually, I'm attending a fundraising party there tonight. That sounds like a formal party. What will it cost to get in? I don't know. I'm covering it for the newspaper, so I get in free. I thought the museum was closed today. It is, but the party isn't till 7 o'clock tonight. Sounds like fun. Enjoy yourself. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to get back to work. The big city, the Big Apple, New York, Manhattan Island, planet Earth, Milky Way, galaxy, whatever you call it, it's your kind of town. The nameplate on the impressive steamship identifies it as the Andrea Doria. Greetings, madam. I can motivate you to your destination if you can prove that you're a reporter or if you have American currency. To what location would you like to be motivated, madam? Have you read that new book by Carl Sandburg? It's Abraham Lincoln, The Prairie Years. Actually, it's the first two volumes of a six-volume biography, and I find it quite stimulating reading. Thanks for traveling with us, madam. Have a pleasant day. There appear to be shops on either side of the quaintly painted storefront, but none of them hold your interest. The sign reads, Low Fats, 
This must be that low-fats place you've heard so much about since arriving in New York City. This little boy is trying to set fire to ants. He's shabbily dressed and poorly groomed. He's peering intently at the panicking ants on the sidewalk. This youngster looks like a real roughneck. He appears slightly older than the other two boys, his brown hair wild and unruly, and a look of studied indifference on his face. The indifference is heightened by the nonchalant way he's burning ants with a magnifying glass. You see a rotund, unhappy-looking boy. The other boys, who are industriously setting fire to ants with a magnifying glass, seem to be tolerating his presence, but largely ignore him. What's your name, little boy? None of your beeswax. You're quite the impertinent little boy, aren't you? Yeah, well, my folks told me not to talk to strangers. His name's Paul Untermeyer. Yeah, but we call him Stinky because his initials are P.U. So what's your name, little boy? Biff. My, what a nice name. It's a nice day, isn't it? I don't know. Well, there's not a cloud in the sky and the sun is shining. I guess. Makes the ants light quicker, that's for sure. So, what are you doing? Giving these crummy ants a hot foot. Wanna try? Thank you kindly. Some other time. Your loss, lady. So, do you have any interest in hobbies? Killing ants, hitting baseballs through windows, and passing all my wisdom to those younger than me. What's it to you? Just asking. Yeah? Well, don't ask again. How would you like this baseball? No, thank you, ma'am. My parents say baseball gives me hives. This nifty baseball wouldn't be of any use to you, would it? I don't know. Let's see it. Hmm, not bad. I'm not sure about this Bob Ruth signature, but it's not a bad imitation. Stitching integrity is about 89%. Want to trade? That's just what I was thinking. I could use that magnifying glass you boys are using. Hey, Scram, we're using this glass. Have we got a deal? Okay, why not? Here you go. Hey, what a jip. Now how are we going to moitalize these ants? Ease up, Stinky. We're almost out of ants anyway. Then we'll go to Old Man Meadow's place and bust up his windows. Yeah! Thanks, lady. Pleasure doing business, witches. Thank you, young man. You pick it up and place it in your purse. There are no cars coming from this direction. There are no cars coming from this direction. This is a rough part of town with several abandoned buildings. The sidewalk looks dirty. The front door to the abandoned flower shop. It's locked. Drink Moxie. It's good for you. It 
looks a lot like garbage. There must be some serious alcoholics who live nearby because the trash is loaded with liquor bottles. The battered side door to the flower shop, complete with a mail slot and a tiny window. We're closed. No deliveries. Secret word. The password is Charleston. Well, why didn't you say so? Come on in. It's Kruna Jensmith, the amazing dancing chanteuse. It's Dr. Jazz, the piano player. This is only a temporary gig for Doc since he normally plays with Jelly Roll Morton and his Red Hot Peppers. Inexperienced dancers repeatedly practicing the few steps they know. It's the bartender. Now, you want a drink, miss? No, thank you, sir. I don't drink. He's sitting at one of them tables, miss. A serious drinker. It's best not to disturb him. This comatose man has had too much to drink. It's a miracle that he's still standing. They're involved in a deep conversation about President Calvin Coolidge. This man is sleeping peacefully, so it would be a shame to wake him. You're in a speakeasy known as the Harlem Swinger. This being the time of prohibition, illegal alcoholic drinks are sold here in secret. A nervous man with shifty eyes. Are you Ziggy? Who sent ya? Crowdfather, he's an old pal of mine. What you want to know? That's the guy who found that fancy peace seeker in Egypt. That's the new president of the Lion Decker Museum. <laughs> I'm new here. What can you tell me about New York? It's the place to be. All kinds of people come here, like one big smelting pot. 
There's even a high-class international con man in town. But I can't tell you who it is, because he'd kill me if he found out. I, I heard somebody heisted that Egyptian peak seeker from the museum. Rumor on the street is that he was an inside job. What makes you think I know anything about police stations? You think I'm a hood or something? I got friends in high places. Toots up. Don't. Don't mess with me! You mean this speakeasy? He, he, it's the best in town! And I know because I've been to all of them! This year is almost over. How do you feel about 1926? I think it was a great year. I made a sawbuck under Gene Tunney and Jack Dempsey fighting Philly. Was that the Egyptian pig sticker was heisted from the museum. I want to marry an archaeologist and keep his artifacts warm. I travel with him through jungles and deserts and weather out every storm. Do you know anything about Egyptology? The only Egyptian I know is an accountant named Ramses the Niger and something like that. Me sometimes by asking me riddles. I can never figure them out. What kind of riddles? Well, today Ramses came in and asked me a two-part riddle. What's the room you leave without entering? And what's the room you enter without leaving? As usual, I told him I didn't give a hoot about his silly question, so he left. Goodness, has this taxi ever been cleaned? I cleaned it out two years ago. You got a problem with that? Thanks for your critique of my lifestyle, miss. Now get out of my cab! I'll take you for a ride if you got the dough or if you can prove you as a reporter. You can make out part of the text through the food stains. Taxi Operator's License, New York Taxi Control Authority. The driver's name is Bob. There's garbage all over the passenger section of the taxi. Some of it looks very old. It feels like a New York City taxi circa 1926. Although it's old and hard to read, it looks like a laundry claim ticket with Chinese characters on it. An old laundry claim ticket from Low Fats Chinese Laundry.
Okay, Toots, where can I take you? Chinatown. There are some stairs leading up a dark and dangerous looking passageway. After a quick glance at the dark staircase, you decide that it's potentially hazardous to your health and that there can't possibly be anything of interest upstairs. The sign reads, Low Fats. This must be that low fats place you've heard so much about since arriving in New York City. This is the interior of Low Fats Chinese Laundry. Apparently Low Fat does a good bit of hand tailoring. The shelves are filled with fabrics, silks, wools, cottons and satins. In another 50 years or so, these will all be replaced with snazzy, durable acetates. This oversized cart is brimming with other people's dirty laundry. You see an older oriental gentleman standing behind the counter toiling away with an industrial iron. Excuse me? Yes, please? I was just wondering, uh, do you work here? Yes, take it please. Pardon? Take it please, you here to pick up, yes? Oh. No, I'm sorry, I was just looking around. Okay, look all you want. Looking is free, laundry not so. What can you tell me about low fats Chinese laundry? Look around, you standing in it. claim ticket two years old today. You very lucky woman, almost give this clothes away. It'll be ready Tuesday. <laughs> Just kidding, ancient Chinese joke. Actually, this isn't mine at all. I found this claim ticket just a little while ago. I'd feel badly if somebody would have come back for this. You worry for nothing. Nobody come in for two-year-old laundry. Lady who owned this dress probably dead by now. <laughs> You're a strange man, Mr. Fat, but I kind of like you. to the Lion Decker Museum? Of course. Low fat big contributor to museum. Two dollar every year. Some customer also work at museum. Wolf Heimlich, security guard. Very important. Anybody else from the museum ever come here? Yes, yes, let me think. Woman doctor, Greek name. Um, Olympia something. Magellacati Mc... Miklos? Yes, that's it. Olympia Miklos. Not know what she do at museum, but she work there. 
she and Mr. Heimlich sometime come in together. Have you been there recently? Not been there in, oh, must be almost a year. Whoa, time to send in another two dollar. Besides Mr. Hamlick and Dr. Miklos, are any of your other customers museum employees? Not think so. Oh, wait, how could I forget? Yvette Delacroix, very lovely lady. She work at museum. Has Ziggy been in lately? Ziggy? No Ziggy come in here. Would remember name like that. Sound like good name for comic strip though. coming from this direction. Crossing the street will lead you to a flower shop. There are no cars coming from this direction. We're closed. No deliveries. Secret word. The password is Charleston. Well, why didn't you say so? Come on in. Looking for a good time? It's your loss, toots. I'll be right here if you change your mind. You look so cute in that outfit. It makes me want to scream. Nice body. But where did you get those clothes? Salvation Army? The flapper is watching you. You haven't seen the Countess come into the speakeasy yet, have you? I've been waiting here for hours. The Countess? Yeah, the Countess Slovenia Waldorf Carlton. I'm supposed to meet her here. Sorry, haven't seen her. But if I do, I'll be sure and let you know. Thanks, toots. about the Countess? She's a nice old broad. Loaded. She's married to some high-class museum bigwig. But she can't get enough. Know what I mean? No, I don't know what you mean. You're pulling my leg, right? No, I'm not pulling anything. I'm not that kind of girl. Well, you're trying to pull something, sister. And I don't like it. I'm not answering no more questions about the Countess.
Your perky demeanor and thorough technique are making you a first-class detective. The entrance to the museum is framed with impressive marble columns. This is exactly the sort of architectural touch that seems so popular these days. There is a tall, imposing gentleman guarding the door. He appears to be wearing a German military uniform. This affair is by invitation only, Fräulein. Your papers, please. Danke, Fräulein. I'll return this pass when you are leaving. Enjoy yourself this evening. It's a colossal bust of the pharaoh Ramses II, discovered at the Ramesseum, his mortuary temple on the Nile's west bank opposite present-day Luxor. The complete Ramses statue stood nearly 60 feet tall and weighed more than 1,000 tons. Presumably Ramses was not this large in life, although many people have stated that Ramses had a big head. This man looks like he's very low on moral fiber in his construction. His eyes dart around the room nervously, as if he's expecting someone to jump on him. His bald head reflects the overhead lighting. Heard any good rumors lately? Maybe, or maybe not. What's it worth to you? Well, I don't have any money right now. Then I ain't got no rumors for you, toots. Augustini. Uh, Augustini, yeah, that name rings a bell. Oh, yeah, uh, ain't he the concierge at the plaza? Can't help you with that, toots. The new museum press? Stodgy old guy, but a fine chap. Yeah, that's it, a fine chap. Good man. I'll tell you, most of the cops around these towns stink. But all right, this chief, and he, he sees okay. He really knows how to treat a mouthpiece, you know. I made some good jack working for him. Certainly I have. Definitely one of the most up-and-up guys I know. Keeps his nose clean, but knows how to have a good time. <laughs> Isn't that what they named the stiffs when they don't have an ID? 
I'm sorry, but I simply have to say that your pronunciation is dreadful. Hey, that's an insult, right? What's up with this Ziggy Joker? Hey, watch your mouth. You're talking to him. Yeah, the dock worker. I know that guy. He ain't in my inner circle, though. Don't know much about the Joel. What makes you think I knows anything about a dame like her? She's... she won't even have anything to do with me. I I mean, I... I don't know anything about her. Now, why ask me? That's odd. She seems to know you. She did? What did she say? It ain't true. Listen, that old cow couldn't keep a secret if her life depended on it. I ain't taking the rap for her anyways. Now leave me alone before I cause the cops! Or somebody. Quiet guy most of the time. Accountant, I think. Boy, I'll tell ya, those Egyptians know some crummy jokes. That lady's scary. I've been avoiding her. Nice working girl. I, I knew her when. Now, well, now she's a big hotshot museum. What do you call it? Back then, she was a, a, a streetwalker, if you catch my drift. <laughs> hmm, I don't think I've heard of him. You mean the newspaper? Not me, sister. I prefer my news straight from the horse's patootie if you catch my drift. <laughs> Have you had any contact with the police? Yeah, I suppose you could say that. I'm sort of a, a, a freelance detective. I find things out that the police can't, then I pass along the information. For a price. Sounds like a most valuable service. Oh yeah, they couldn't do their jobs right without me. Nice guys, them cops. Kiss me flush. Salts of the earth. Laundry, laundry. Oh, you mean like washing her clothes? No, I does that myself. You're familiar with the 12th Street docks, aren't you? Not me, lady. Mostly your unsavory types hang out down there. I know everything's not what it looks to be, but then, what is? 
Same with all these Maki Maks. Look, appearances can be deceiving. Me, do, do I look like the brother of a famous Broadway producer? No, but I am! You know, you know, some days it's a rich smelting pot, but some days it's a big cesspool. But you know, you gotta rise to the top like scum and keep your feet and your nose clean. That's how I does it anyway. You seen it? I saw you in there before. It is what it is. Hey, I'm a philosopher. <laughs> I, I don't need no notebook. I already knows everything. Papers, I never needed one. How was your year, Mr. Ziggy? Sepoib. Simply Sepoib. First I mix a sawbuck on the Tunny Dempsey match. Now here I am rubbing elbow grease with a hoity-toity. Thanks for asking. I know the dagger was heisted. I might even know who done it, but I ain't talking. If you know, why won't you go to the police? All I got is a suspicion. I got nothing hard. Besides, what have the cops done for me lately? This is in the interests of justice. Who are you trying to protect? I'm trying to protect me. Now flip. about Egyptology. We talked about that before, remember? I told you that crazy Egyptian riddle that Ramses guys passed along. Dr. Pippin Carter is a tall, dignified, middle-aged gentleman with a carefully trimmed mustache. This is quite a party. Does a museum always have a big fundraiser when they open a new exhibit, Dr. Carter? No, but they've never had such an important exhibit opening here before. And I'm an important curator with an important salary, so the museum wouldn't have been able to keep me employed here without financial assistance. You must be very important for the museum to go to so much trouble. Naturally. The museum is lucky that I accepted this position as the head of their new Egyptian antiquities department. Why, my name alone will attract more visitors and more money to the museum. Any chance that the Tut Uncommon exhibit will make a stop here on its American tour? No. I'd hate to embarrass my relative by putting his Tutankhamun artifacts on display here. They pale by comparison to my own great discoveries, such as the Dagger of Amun-Ra. Of course. How silly of me to think otherwise. Yes, that was rather silly of you. I believe he was the Emperor of Rome just after Justinian.
That's me, you silly girl. If you want to arrange an in-depth interview, we'll have to schedule it later in the week. Dr. Carrington is a fine chap. He used to be in charge of the British Museum, you know. I ran into him several years ago when I visited the British Museum to consult with Dr. Butch. Seems odd that Dr. Carrington doesn't remember me, but I almost didn't recognize him either. He's getting old, after all. Looks different. Memory's probably shot as well. Ah, yes. Can't say I'm too impressed with Detective O'Reilly. Couldn't find a single bloody clue about the Durga burglary. And he has the nasty habit of chewing on grapes constantly, probably to cover up the smell of the alcohol he drinks. A crud follow is some sort of miniature vegetable, isn't it? A potato, perhaps. He runs one of the local Chinese laundries. Pretends to be Chinese so he can get more business, but he has a terrible accent. A relative of yours, perhaps. Rather an unfortunate name, I think. Steve Dorian. The Stevador with a ridiculous name. He's the fellow who helped unload my artifacts from the steamship. If it weren't for his odd name, I would have forgotten him entirely. The Countess was married to the former president of the Lion Decker Museum, Sterling Waldorf Carlton. A good chap, but uninspired. Now she has a sight set on Dr. Carrington. Of course I know Ramses. There were several of them, actually. Ramses I was pharaoh during the 19th dynasty from 1307 to 1306 BC. But Ramses II made more of an impact on ancient Egypt. From 1290 to 1224 BC, Ramses II undertook a succession of gargantuan construction projects which left his mark in the face of Egypt for thousands of years. His mortuary site at Thebes, the Ramesseum, contains a temple to Amun-Ra, a royal palace, a mortuary temple, and several storerooms. Actually, I was referring to Ramses Najir. Never heard of him. Dr. Miklos is rather eccentric, but she is well educated. Received her training at one of the better universities in Athens, Greece. She's considered quite knowledgeable in the area of hieroglyphics, but her speciality is paleontology. She's fond of old bones. That 
that trollop sleeps with everything that moves, and some things that don't. It's only by sheer strength of will that I've resisted her advances so far. Ah yes, I'm Lex the security chief here. Not a particularly good one, obviously, since the dagger was stolen right from under his nose. And he's rather too intense for my tastes. It's one of those local scandal periodicals. The term yellow journalism comes to mind when I think of it, which means it's not much of a newspaper at all, really. It's more like printed chewing gum for the uneducated masses. Now, wait a minute. The Tribune is a fine newspaper of the highest quality. I know because I happen to work there. You've just proven my point. Well, I never. Maybe that's your problem. I don't have to stand here and take this abuse. You're right, you don't. You could just go away and make us both happy. The police station is the last refuge for the incompetence in this city. However, if you're looking for a constable, I'd suggest one of the donut shops. People tell me Low Fats is a good place to have laundry done, but he always puts too much starch in my shirts. That's why I arrived on the steamship Andrea Doria. I came over with the artifacts for the Egyptian exhibit. Apparently Dr. Carrington was also on that voyage from England, but I never ran into him aboard ship. Keeps to himself a lot, you know. With a little work, I can turn the Lion Decker into a world-class museum. But that can wait a few months until they decide to make me the president. Dr. Carrington will have to find other employment, of course, but I'm sure some lesser museum would be happy to have him on their staff. Since you're new here, what do you think of New York? Isn't it exciting? I hate it. It's crowded, it's noisy, and you Americans have no concept of how the class system is supposed to work. You go around treating each other like equals, which I find very distasteful. If you're referring to the local drinking establishments, they are quite illegal, and I don't condone their existence. I do drink on occasion, but only when the finest wines are available. No thanks, I already have a notepad. Don't bother me with such silly questions. Would you say this has been a good year for you, sir? Well, let's see. I made the most important archaeological discovery of all time. Almost everyone on the planet knows my name, and I've clinched a curatorial job I've been after for years. Yes, I'd say it has been a rather good year. 
Hmm, seems to me you might have a problem. A problem? Such as? Well, you've accomplished so much this year. What are you gonna do next? Next? What next? Don't bother me with such ludicrous questions, you silly female. You must be very upset about the burglary. Quite so. If I ever find out who stole my dagger of Amun Ra, they won't live to regret it, I can assure you. Oh my! Do you have any idea who would do such a thing? I have my suspicions, but I need more proof before I subject him to the full force of my wrath. Have the police learned anything? Those incompetence. Hardly. They couldn't even find any clues around the dagger display. Sounds like the burglar might have been a professional. Perhaps. It's more likely the local constable couldn't find a clue if it jumped up and bit him on the bum. Since you're an expert on the subject, what can you tell me about Egyptology? I don't have time to explain the intricacies of my profession to a neophyte. If you're truly interested, I'd suggest several years of difficult study on the subject at one of your better universities. Once you've finished that, you can talk to me again. this woman with a certain amount of jealousy. Her fashionably high cheekbones, impeccably styled hair, and sultry eyes make you feel mousy and naive by comparison. Bonjour, Miss Ball. Dr. Carrington told me you were covering this party for the newspaper. I'm Yvette Delacroix. That's right, Miss Delacroix. I'm writing the social news column. Ah, the social news. I was thinking you were here about the burglary. The burglary? Oh, of course not. The newspaper would never assign a female cub reporter like myself to such an important story. Ah, you are probably being correct, Miss Bo. Monsieur Agostini? You know him? I understand he's a very powerful man at the newspaper. I would like to meet him sometime. Ah, oh, Monsieur Pippin. He is such a great man. And quite attractive, no? Dr. Carrington is my superior, so I'd rather not be saying the bad things about him. What bad thing? He is very strange, even for a man. Ah, uh, but you are trying to trick me, no? It's best that I am not talking about him. Ah, Monsieur O'Reilly, he is magnifique. He is so intelligent, so confident, so... Ooh la la. I assume you've met him before tonight. Oh yes, we are, how do you say, the old friends. And it never hurts to have the highly placed friend on the local police force, no? I suppose that's true. What do you think of his burglary investigation? People here, they keep saying Monsieur O'Reilly. His investigation of the dagger is not good, but he tries very hard. I have seen him work, but the dagger thief, he is very good, no? Hey, you think the burglar was a man? 
It is only the manner of speaking, Miss Paul. This burglar, she could have been the female as well. <laughs> oh, the cod follower. I met him only once on the train. The train was the sleeper car. It was dark, and I climbed into his berth by mistake. He will always remember that meeting, I am sure. I, unfortunately, will have forgotten it in a few months. The low fat, I know him. The little laundry I take to the cleaners, low fat does it himself. We have the deal he enjoys, so it costs me nothing. I do not believe I have met your father, Miss Bo, unless it was long ago and I have forgotten. I have met so many men, it is hard to keep track of them all. The annoying little man? I met him at this speakeasy long ago, but he is not my class of person, no. He is of the criminal type. Ah, this Steve, he is so big and handsome, no? Ah, the Countess, she is not what she seems, no? What do you mean? Her last husband, he was afraid of her. He told me. Then as I learned more, I was becoming afraid of her, too. Why? She seems like a nice old lady. It is all the act, no? She is a dangerous one. Now I think she is after Dr. Carrington's money, since I am seeing them together so often lately. I don't understand. Why is she so dangerous? Just be trusting me, Miss Bo. Stay away from the Countess. People die when she's around. Oh dear! Monsieur Najir, he is a funny little man. I see him in many strange places in the museum. But he is only the accountant for us, so I don't understand why he is here all the time. Do you think Mr. Najir could have stolen the dagger? Why, because he is the Egyptian? I do not think so, Miss Bo, but I do not know him so very well. He is a man after all, and who knows how they are thinking. Dr. Miklos and I, we have much of the fun together. She is very friendly. Many times we have run through the museum chasing the daisy, no? Yes, I am Yvette Delacroix, but I am not one to be talking about myself too much, no? I am not like the great Dr. Carter, who has so many of the great stories to tell. Monsieur Heimlich, he is the intense fellow, no? Very military, very stiff and straight. I feel very safe around him, but I also feel uncomfortable. He patrols the museum so much. It is strange the dagger was stolen from under his nose, no? Do you suspect him of stealing the dagger? Who knows? I am not the policeman. But he seemed very upset about the burglary. Maybe too upset, no?
I only read the financial section of the newspaper. The stock market, it is looking so good, I am going to buy some very soon. I support the police in every possible way I can. I have never been to the police station, but I know many street cops and detectives, and they are all the gentlemen to me. Monsieur Lofat, he does some of the laundry, but I do most of the lacy and delicate things myself, no? The dogs? Ah, there are many of the men down there and they are so big and so charming. They have been very generous to me. The museum, it is such a wonderful place to work. The people, they are so friendly and I am enjoying my work here. I intend to be the president someday. New York, it is a rough place for the newcomer, no? So many people in the one place, it reminds me of Paris, but it is where all the money is, no? The Americans, they have so much more money than the French. This big easy, it used to be the good place of the business for me, no? Then I got this job, so I don't have to do that anymore. What kind of work did you do at the speakeasy? I was the hostess there for a while. With your appearance, you must have gotten a lot of tips. Hmm, I suppose you could be calling it that. I got the very big tip. It is a nice notebook, Laura. Take the good notes and you'll be the good reporter. Do not look at me too closely, Miss Bo. I found the line on my face yesterday and I am still upset about it. Ah, oh, yes. Every year is a good year for me, Miss Bo. It is all a matter of the attitude, no? Why, that seems like a very healthy point of view. Merci, Miss Bo. You are very kind. It is terrible to think someone could break into this museum and steal something so valuable. Monsieur Heimlich, he is all broken up about it, although he doesn't show it. How did Dr. Carrington react to the burglary? Dr. Carrington is a very dignified man. There is not much you can learn from his face. He seems to have taken the burglary very well, although he was angry with Wolf about the poor security. Do you have any idea who might have stolen the dagger? There are many suspicious people here tonight who could have done it. The Countess, for example, or the little man Ziggy. But I have not the proof, you understand? You should ask Dr. Miklos or Dr. Smith about that. This snappily dressed man looks like an accountant, but there's an air of mystery about him as well. Good evening, sir. My name is Laura Bow. I am Ramses Najia, Miss Bow. Pleased to make your acquaintance.
I'm afraid I do not know Mr. Agostini. I live a very quiet life, and I do not know very many famous people. A thousand curses on that man! He defiled the tombs of my sacred ancestors for his own personal glory. He doesn't care a fig for what's right and what's wrong. His own evil deeds will catch up with him, though. Just wait and see. I have heard a great deal about Mr. Carrington, but I do not know him very well. We have only spoken once or twice, but he seems like a cultured, charming fellow. To be perfectly honest, I do not care for Mr. O'Reilly. I do not think he sees the beauty in ancient Egypt. He has somewhat blunted his approach to others as well. I suppose that is just part of his job, however. Crab follows? No, thank you. I try to restrict my intake of sugar. It has a bad effect on me. I'm afraid I do not know the gentleman. I lead a rather solitary life, just me and my little family. John Bow is your father? I have never had the pleasure of meeting him. I have never been to New Orleans, you see. That much humidity does not agree with me. I do not know Ziggy very well, but he makes me uneasy. His eyes remind me of a jackal's. I met him briefly at the party, then avoided him the rest of the time. Mr. Dorian is a very healthy-looking young man. His mother must have eaten well. Countess is quite a colorful lady. She seems to enjoy life to the fullest, does she not? Just between you and me, she scares me a little. Why is that, Mr. Najia? Well, she's just too enthusiastic for me, I suppose. Why, I am Ramsey's Nadir, Miss Bo. I am an accountant and a proud father of two and a half. <music> Dr. Miklos is a brilliant individual, but she is certainly a little strange. Ah oh, well, we all have our foibles, don't we, Miss Bo? Miss Yvette is a charming young lady, and so friendly. She seems genuinely interested in Egyptology. We had a long discussion about tombs one time. I find Mr. Heimlich to be most intimidating. He seems to enjoy looming over people. I enjoy the Tribune very much, Miss Bow. I 
read the financial page every morning of my life. The police are useless. It is not the police who will uncover the thief of the dagger. It will be his own evil deeds turned back on him like an angry cobra. I personally do not use that laundry, Miss Bo. I go to an Egyptian laundry on 44th Street. They are wonderful with linens. Oh dear, the docks are very rough places, Miss Bo. I stay away from them. I would suggest that you do the same. Attractive young ladies like yourself are the favorite prey of the jackals who prowl there at night. The Lion Decker is a beautiful museum, Miss Bo, but I do not approve of the spoiling of my ancestors' tombs, much less the wanton display of their bodies and their personal effects. The city of New York, Mr. Najia. Well, it is a very lucrative place for an accountant to set up shop, but the city itself is rather large and frightening. I wouldn't know, Miss Bo. I am a family man, and I do not frequent such scandalous places. See you carry a notebook. I carry one too, in case I should think of some particularly exciting mathematical formula at an inconvenient time. How interesting. You carry a magnifier. Are your eyes poor? I am very nearsighted myself. It came from years of looking at tiny little numbers. Mr. Najia, would you say that 1926 has been a good year for you? Well, yes, I would have to say so. Business in America is booming, and many people need an accountant. I have not wanted for work and my beloved wife Isis is soon to deliver our third child. I suppose I am as happy as a man could be. Congratulations on the upcoming blessed event, Mr. Najia. What are your other children's names? Well, there's Horus and Amon, and the new baby shall be named Anubis, after the wise and just Lord of the Dead. Oh, how lovely. But what if the child is a girl? The name shall be Anubis either way. It is a wonderful name for either a boy or a girl. Mr. Najia, would you have any idea who might have stolen the dagger of Amon Ra? No. But whoever did could be boiled alive. He should be fed to hungry crocodiles. His guts should be strung from the pyramids. He should... Oh, excuse me. I get a little passionate on the subject. Quite all right, Mr. Najia. I understand. Are you an Egyptologist, Mr. Najia? No, not professionally. I have always been interested in the history of my country and made a point of studying it. I am particularly interested in ancient Egyptian religions. This short, blustery man reminds you vaguely of President Roosevelt. 
Despite his diminutive frame, his bearing is self-assured and cocky, and his pince-nez only adds to the aura of distinguished snobbery. Good evening, Dr. Carrington. Good evening, Miss Bow. Good evening. I'm afraid I don't know the gentleman. The fellow has quite an overinflated ego, but he's got a legitimate reason for it, I suppose. Well, that's me, young lady. Dr. Archibald Carrington III, at your service. Oh, he's a good enough chap for a law enforcement peon. I'm not acquainted with the chap. I've never even seen the chap. I've never met your father, Miss Bow, but I have a deep respect for the minions who uphold the law. Miss Bow? I find it vaguely offensive that you would even think that I know anyone named Ziggy. A stevedore? I'm afraid I don't discourse with proletarian ruffins of that stripe. Now there's a lady who truly supports the arts. A real patron, that old girl. Now there's an intense personality. He doesn't look it, but there's something seething below the surface. I'm frightfully sure of it. In any case, the fellow is a fine accountant. Dr. Miklas is one of the museum's most respected curators. I am, uh, I really haven't had much interaction with Miss Delacroix. Well, of course, she is my assistant. So I guess I should correct myself and say that I do have, inter uh, uh, I mean, interaction with her. But I don't know her very well, really. He's a real pip. A genuine go-getter, that fellow. He does a jolly good job of guarding the museum. Jolly good. I don't read the newspaper, Miss Bow. I find it eternally depressing. Oh, those poor chaps do their best, I suppose. Good heavens, Miss Bow, my houseman does my laundry. I never go to public establishments when I can possibly avoid it. I've only been there once, 
but I found the docks to be full of pugilistic ruffians and parasite-infested rodentia. The Lion Decker is simply fantastic, Miss Bow. This is the opportunity of a lifetime. Do you like New York, Dr. Carrington? To be frightfully honest, at first I found it to be a bit rough around the edges. But now I'm beginning to see its somewhat primitive charm. Miss Bow, I wouldn't be caught dead in one of those nocturnal dens of iniquity. I dare say it's a bit forward for you to go about writing things about people in that little notebook of yours, Miss Bow. Some people cherish their privacy. I see you want to get a good look at our displays, Miss Bo. I have to respect that. Have you found 1926 to be a good year for you, Dr. Carrington? Yes, I would, Miss Bo. Frightfully good. And what is that, Doctor? It's not often that one gets the opportunity to head up the most respected museum in America, Miss Bow. What do you make of the theft of the dagger, Dr. Carrington? It's simply beastly. What is the world coming to when crepuscular ruffians can invade a museum like Visigoths? Do you have any idea who could have done such a thing? Not at all. But if I did, I'd be tempted to teach the brute a lesson. Egyptology is all quite the fashion now, Miss Bow. But it's been a serious science for many years. I can recommend a number of fine books if you're interested. Buffet tables are heaped with food, champagne, and water. The food and champagne look good, but you're trying to stay on a diet so you make the wise decision to leave them alone. Neatly stacked water glasses. Some are full, some are empty. As a wise man once said, even empty water glasses have their uses. You pick it up and place it in your purse. A crystal water receptacle. It's the doorway to the gift shop. These appear to be copies of ancient Egyptian artifacts. They seem to be nicely crafted. These are replicas of early 12th century Celtic insect trapping pottery. They appear to be broken parts of some kind, probably authentic artifacts, or maybe someone just dropped them. 
It's the cash register. Laura, you'd never steal. It's a painting of the pharaoh Uber Spamaton hunting geese in the springtime with his hounds and his son, Nyet. What a beautiful painting of the mask of Tutankhamun. You wish you had the money to buy it. It looks just like the dagger of Amon-Ra. Isn't it beautiful? The dagger shows Pittsburgh's high degree of craftsmanship. The dagger shows Pittsburgh's high degree of craftsmanship. The dagger shows a high degree of craftsmanship. Fräulein, the gift shop is closed. You should not be here. Oh, I'm sorry. The door was unlocked. Unlocked? My assistant will be disciplined harshly for this mistake. Please rejoin the party now, or I will be forced to injure you. There I was, standing on the hillside above the excavation in the Valley of the Kings, with the faithful Mahmud describing the dance of the seven veils to me in great detail, when a shout arose up from the workers below us. Sensing an important discovery at hand, since I have a sixth sense about these things, I scurried downhill to see that a step had been uncovered in the sand. It turned out to be the entrance to the Temple of Amon-Ra. I took the trowel from the Boscafir and cleared the sand away from the rest of the steps myself, revealing the entrance to the temple. The seal of the necropolis was intact on the door seal, indicating that the temple had not been disturbed. I knew that fate had brought me to the discovery I had been seeking for so long. Tireless after my exertion in clearing the staircase, I used a sledgehammer to break through the sealed doorway. Within lay the greatest accomplishment of my considerable career. Hidden within the darkness, untouched for thousands of years in the isolated temple, lay the magnificent dagger of Amon-Ra, the greatest discovery of modern archaeology. Good show! Magnifique! Very impressive, Dr. Carter! So, that's when you heisted it, right? <laughs> no, I didn't heist it, you annoying little man. I took it out of the temple and showed it to the workers, who immediately fell upon their faces, all 350 of them, to show respect for my accomplishment. 
That's hard to believe, Dr. Carter. Egyptian workers have proudly worked the archaeological digs for many years. I would not think they'd exaggerate their respect for you to such an extent. But then you weren't there, were you, Mr. Najir? Well, no, that's true. And when was the last time you were in Egypt, Mr. Najir? You seem to have lost some of your accent. Well, it has been several years. I thought as much. Your discovery really was quite a remarkable achievement, Dr. Carter. Was remarkable, Dr. Carrington? You mean, it is a remarkable achievement. There has never been anything like it before. Quite so. Correction noted, Doctor. If you will all be excusing me, I see a man I need to speak to. Certainly, Miss Delacroix. Certainly. Boy, did he bet. She's some dish, ain't she? <laughs> yes, those French women really have something. I don't think my wife would ever have done it in a mummy case. In my vast experience of women from different lands, I tend to agree with you, Mr. Niger. I balked when a certain French woman suggested we have a deep conversation on the back of a dinosaur, but I was pleasantly surprised by the results. Yes, Miss Delacroix is certainly the cat's pajamas, as the Americans would say. Yeah, we does come up with some good sayings, don't we? Quite. Good Lord, I hadn't realized a woman was present. Please excuse us, Miss Bow. Oh, I wasn't actually listening to you gentlemen, Dr. Carrington. I just happened to be standing here. Excuse me. Ryan, I'm having the hardest of times keeping my hands off you. Not here, Yvette. There's too many people. They are not important. You are the most powerful man here, my Ryan. What about that Carrington guy? He's president of this museum. The doctor, he is old and weak. You are the young one, and strong. And what would you be wanting, Miss Bow? Oh, well, I thought I heard you call my name. You must have been hearing things. I didn't even mention your name. Oh, sorry. Uh, I've got to be going now. Excuse me. And what were you doing when that fancy dagger was being stolen then? Let me see. Hmm, I was sleeping in my hotel room. You don't sound too sure about that. I haven't been sleeping too well since I arrived in this country. I'm tired, so I'm not thinking too well. You're not sleeping well. Would you be having a guilty conscience then? I do not understand your meaning, Mr. O'Reilly. Perhaps it is the English. It is such a curious language, not as clear as the Egyptian. Well, you say the dagger is what brought you to this country. If I were in your position, I'd be tempted to steal it. Steal what has already been stolen? The dagger of Amon-Ra belongs to the Egyptian people, Mr. O'Reilly. Not to Dr. Carter, not to this museum, and not to this country. I'd be watching what you're saying, Dr. Smith. You're digging your hole deeper with every word. Amandra will seek his own vengeance on those who have removed his dagger from Egypt. Amandra does not require my help. You say you were sleeping when it was stolen. Were you alone? That, sir, is none of your business. Ah, oh, that's where you're wrong, Dr. Smith. It is my business, as long as you're a suspect in the burglary. A suspect? Do you Americans have no shame? 
I am here to gain the return of the dagger by legal means. Ask Dr. Carrington. I have talked to Dr. Carrington, and I know he told you no dice. The matter is not settled until the last camel drinks from the water of the oasis. What's that? Some kind of Egyptian double talk? Excuse me, sir, but I see a turkey leg on the buffet table that requires my attention. If you want to know my theory about it, I think it was stolen by an Egyptian. No offense to your people, Mr. Najir, but I think there is a secret sect of Egyptian sun worshippers who have sent an envoy here to steal the dagger. Countess, I hardly think that's likely. Secret sects like you're describing haven't existed in hundreds of years. Oh, really? And what makes you such an authority on secret sects, Mr. Najir? Well, I am only expressing my opinion, madam. I'm certainly not an expert on the subject. Quite so. I think my theory is as good as anyone's, darling. And I heard it from a reliable source. Oh? Who is that? Never mind. Let's just say my source has never been wrong before. Hmm. There's always a first time for everything, Countess. I still find your theory far-fetched. Since you seem to be listening, Miss Bow, what do you think of my theory? What? Oh, I definitely think it's worth considering, Countess. There, you see, Mr. Najir. The press takes me seriously. Hmm. Of course, it is kind of far-fetched. Huh! Well, I never! Excuse me. Oh, did I say something wrong? I'm sorry. So that's the deal, Countess. I'd rather not talk about it right now. Yeah, no kidding. The walls got ears around here. And so does certain nosy reporters, if you know what I mean. Yes. Now, if you'll excuse me, I simply must speak to Dr. Carrington. Sure thing, toots. Ain't you the hoity-toity dame these days? <laughs> I almost didn't recognize you with your clothes on. <laughs> Excusez-moi, am I knowing you, sir? Ziggy's my moniker. You gonna pretend you doesn't know me? Ah, <laughs> uh, you are making the joke with me, no? Perhaps you have confused me with someone else? I ain't joking. You're a bad telecrow. <laughs> I, I know that body of yours anywhere. I am sure I am not knowing what you mean, Monsieur Ziggy. Oh, I get it. Yous is worried one of these hi hats is gonna hear us, right? Oh, okay. I'm clued in. We can talk later. Are you enjoying the culinary delights this evening, Miss Delacroix? This food, it is adequate. I do not eat so much. This way I maintain my figure, no? Ah, yes. Uh, and a lovely figure it is, Miss Delacroix. Merci, Dr. Carrington. You are so kind. I feel we've known each other long enough. Please call me Archibald. As you wish, Archibald. I am yours to command, as always. Miss Bow, is there something I can do for you? 
Oh no, I was just admiring Miss Delacroix's dress. Merci, Miss Bo. And your gown, it is a bit out of date, but charming nonetheless. Thank you, I think. Well, if you ladies will excuse me, I must mingle with the guests. Well, well, look what the leprechaun's dragged in. Hey, now watch what you calls me, alrighty. I don't know what that leprechaun thing is, but I don't like the sound of it. I'm sure you've been called worse things, smart guy. Only by low-class type poisons, O'Reilly. By the way, ain't you afraid of being seen with me? Cops talk to stoolies all the time, and I was wondering what you're doing here. I'm a big patron of the arts. That's the kind of high-class guy I am. You don't even know what the word patron means. It does too. Okay, what does patron mean? Um, hey, ain't that the countess I see over there? I need to talk to her. One thing I am admiring about the Egyptian man is the way he is treating his woman with the strong hand and the firm words. Well, that is the proper way, as our culture teacheth us. Which is not to say our culture is primitive by any means. Our civilization has evolved over thousands of years, so our methods are quite well thought out and practical. Mmm, and the Egyptian man. He is very skilled in the private matters as well, no? Well, uh, speaking for myself, I feel it is my sacred duty to be knowledgeable in all matters that concern me. I've certainly had no complaints about my skills, Mrs. Delacroix. Ah, Miss Bow, I didn't see you standing there. Ahem. <clears throat> well, I hear another turkey leg calling my name at the buffet table. So if you'll excuse me. The turkey leg, it sounds good to me also. I'll accompany you, Dr. Smith. That's right, we met at the docks. Oh dear, your shoes. They aren't exactly formal. Oh, well, I can explain that, but not right now. I see. Well, mm, what brings you here? You. Oh, me? You told me you'd be here tonight and, well, I thought we should talk. Could we step outside for a minute? The moonlight is very nice tonight. Well, all right. I think I'd enjoy that. I just wanted to explain to you who I really am. You're not Steve Dorian? Uh, well, yes, I am Steve Dorian, but I felt like I didn't give you the most accurate impression of myself when I met you earlier today. But, gee willikers, I'm just not used to meeting attractive young ladies on the docks. I was...
wasn't down there looking for a man. I'm a professional journalist working on a story. Oh, well, yes, of course you are. I didn't mean to imply anything. In fact, I was very impressed with your professionalism and with your smile. I just didn't want you to think I'm a common stevedore. Well, I'll admit I was wondering what a stevedore was doing at this ritzy museum fundraiser. My stevedore job pays the bills, but I'm aiming for a career as an artist. However, I'm really here because I'd hate myself for the rest of my life if I didn't try to see you again. Maybe I'm a fool, maybe you think we're too different, but I had to try. Well, I'm very flattered. Are you always this nervous? I'm not very good with women. I, I spent all my time working ever since I was ten years old, when my father died. I've never had a chance to date very much. Lately, I've spent my free time going to school. I'm starting to think we're more alike than I first thought. My mother died when I was very young, so I was raised by my father. What kind of an artist are you? I'm a painter, and I do a little sculpting. How interesting! But I think that an artist would know enough not to wear work boots with his tuxedo at a formal party. Oh, I said I'd explain that, didn't I? I was hoping nobody would notice. I had to blow two weeks' pay to rent this tux, but I didn't have enough left over to rent the fancy shoes. It's just that I had to see you again. You spent all your money just to see me? My goodness! I don't know what to say. Say you'll have dinner with me some evening. I, I may seem a little odd, but I promise that I'm harmless. I'd be honored to spend an evening with you and show you the sights around town. Well, I don't usually, but you've gone to a lot of trouble to find me. I think I can trust you. Really? You'll do it? Oh, thank you. You won't regret it. I'll make it a, a memorable evening. I'll paint for you, I'll dance for you, I'll, I'll sing for you, anything you want. Well, there's no need to get carried away. Let's see how dinner goes first. Of course, you're absolutely right. I, I don't seem too anxious, do I? Maybe just a bit, but that's okay. Okay, I'll take a deep breath and calm down. I'll be fine, I'll do whatever you want. I think this is the beginning of something important, Steve. I like you already. Let's go back to the party, Steve. I've got work to do. Countess, they tell me you were married to the last museum president, no? Yes, darling, that's correct. Sterling Waldorf Carlton was such a charming man and so wealthy. My heart is just an empty void without him. Yes, Sterling was such a nice man. It's too bad that he's worm food now. Ew! I prefer to think that Sterling is still with me in spirit. Oh, I'm sure his body is crawling with maggots by now. But if his spirit is with you, let me know because I'd love to see it. It is hard to lose a loved one, no? I understand you were only married this short time, Countess. Yes, I had only two short but charming months of married life with Sterling before he died. And how long had you known this man before you were married? 
we met just one charming month before we decided to get married. It was love at first sight. Where did you meet him? Oh, I'd only been in this country a few weeks when I met Sterling on an offshore casino ship. It's quite legal to drink and gamble there, you know, and all the right people attend. Sterling was so charming, he just swept me off my feet. This Sterling, he must have had the large broom. It's just a manner of speech, my dear. Sterling was a wealthy man. You must have inherited a nice fortune, Countess. The money doesn't matter, darling. Actually, there's an annoying problem with the estate right now. It seems Sterling was changing his will when he died, to give me more money, perhaps. Anyway, I'm sure my attorney will take care of the problem. Too bad you can't dig him up to finish his new will. Yes, quite. The archaeology, it is such a masculine profession. Breaking into the ancient tombs with your sledgehammer, thrusting your way into the treasure chambers, touching the gold artifacts, it is also stimulating, no? Yes, well, when you put it that way, I guess it is rather stimulating being the most important archaeologist of all time. And it is such a burden to bear this greatness, no? With such pressure to perform, you must be perfect all the time. Yes, you have a unique understanding of my problems, Yvette. Are your problems, they are obvious, no? Very kind of you to say that, but there are many who misinterpret my actions. They don't understand the pressure of having famous relatives in the same line of work and having to compare oneself to them all the time. Ah, oh, but the Tutankhamun find, it is nothing when compared to your discovery, no? Correct. I didn't realize you knew so much about archaeology. I know many things, Dr. Carter. So I've heard. Maybe we should discuss archaeology sometime. I'd love to hear about the work you do, Dr. Carter. Perhaps later tonight? Will you be working late tonight? Oh, yes. I think everyone will be here tonight, no? There is much to be done to prepare for the opening of your exhibit tomorrow. I was planning a break for tea around 3 a.m. if you'd like to join me. It sounds wonderful. Perhaps you would uh, come by my office then? I'd be delighted. It is so gracious of you to take the time to speak with me. Nonsense. Think nothing of it. How will I ever repay you for this courtesy? I know how busy you are, Dr. Carter. Hmm. I'm sure we'll think of something. And call me Pippin. I told you to stop bothering me, you camel driver. Dr. Carter, I will stop bothering you when the dagger is safely back in Cairo. I don't know if you've noticed, but the bloody dagger has been stolen from the bloody museum, you great twit. I see no reason to exchange epithets with you, Dr. Carter. I am aware of the burglary. I am also aware that no evidence was left behind and the dagger case was not armed. In fact, I think you removed the dagger from the exhibit. Me? Me? And what bloody reason would I have to steal my own bloody dagger from my own bloody exhibit? The dagger is not yours, Doctor. It belongs to the Egyptian people. As to why you stole it, I do not pretend to understand your twisted American thinking. Perhaps you wanted to keep the dagger for yourself, in your own private collection. Perhaps I should ask why you're shifting the blame onto me, you insignificant peasant. 
It would be very clever of you to steal the dagger, then stay about to start rumors about someone else stealing it. Only an archaeological thief would make such an accusation, Doctor. Now I'm sure that you stole it for yourself. I did not. Yes, you did. Did not. Did. Did not. Did. Gentlemen, please. Who asked you? Mind your own business, you nosy reporter. But I... Uh... I have more important things to do. Our discussion is far from over, Dr. Carter. That's what you think, you malodorous buffoon. Interested in the great art, no? Then you should come with me this evening. I'll give you the personal tour of the old master's gallery. Well, uh, I... I guarantee that you will not be wasting your time. You will enjoy it very much. Well, I... You are studying the art at the university, no? Well, yes, but... Then it is settled. I will give you the private tour in a little while, no? But I... There is no need to thank me yet. I will be enjoying it as much as you will. way that leads to the rest of the museum. This is a mastodon, one of the early mammals. Technically, the mastodon is not a dinosaur at all, but since they date back to prehistory, they're included in the exhibit. This particular example of the order Proboscidea is the Mammoth Americanus, or North American Mastodon. The chief feature which distinguishes this shaggy beast from the elephant and the woolly mammoth are its molar teeth. The museum staff have labeled this a Struthiomimus, literally, ostrich mimic. This is an Ariops skull. Such a large capacity mandible and teensy capacity cranium. This is an Archaeopteryx. Correction, this used to be an Archaeopteryx. Ah, a very nice specimen of Eohippus, somewhat flatter than it appeared in real life. The male and female Triceratops look every inch the proud parents. A fairly accurate model of Struthiomimus or Ostrich Mimic. Suspended overhead by thin wires, the pterodactyl frozen in mid-swoop presents a most horrific tableau. It's a painting of a Spinosaur. 
the painting is accurate and workmanly with little regard for nuance or emotion. It's a Tyrannosaurus Rex. His name is Rex. Isn't that clever? The sign says, push button to hear Rex speak. Welcome to the Leindecker Museum Dinosaur Display. My name is Rex and I'd like to tell you about myself. I'm a type of dinosaur known as Tyrannosaurus Rex, which means King of the Tyrant Lizards. Although I was not the largest type of dinosaur, I was the largest predator ever to walk the Earth. Some of my friends were 40 feet long and weighed 8 tons, with teeth that were 6 inches long. Your modern elephants don't weigh more than six tons. I lived between 250 and 65 million years ago, during a period known as the Age of Dinosaurs, also called the Mesozoic Era. The first complete skeleton of a Tyrannosaurus Rex was found just 24 years ago in Montana in 1902. Although there were many meat-eating dinosaurs, I was considered the best killing machine who ever lived. Speaking of which, I'm feeling a bit hungry. Would you like to volunteer to be my next meal? <laughs> A small sign identifies this dinosaur as an iguanodon, which means iguana tooth. However, from the Tyrannosaurus rex's point of view, this dinosaur could be identified as dinner. A fine painting of a mighty brontosaurus, the thunder lizard. This huge creature with its tiny brain is currently the subject of a controversy. Dr. Earl Douglas from the Carnegie Museum of Natural History believes that current brontosaurus displays have the wrong heads mounted on their skeletons. However, Dr. Oth Neil Marsh, who originally discovered the brontosaurus, believes that the heads on current displays are correct. Only time and more fossil evidence will conclusively prove which of these esteemed gentlemen is correct. A sign on this dinosaur bone display says, please touch. Either these bones feel lonely, or the museum wants you to learn more about the bones by coming into close personal contact with them. You pick it up and place it in your purse. The thigh bone from a young Tyrannosaurus Rex who no longer has any need for it. The suit of armor is empty. The suit of armor is empty.
A fine example of Maximilian armor, made in Germany in 1505. The steel has a characteristic silvery color. Maximilian armor was first used in Milan, which set the fashion for all Europe in matters of dress and armor. Surviving examples of 14th century armor are rare. This armor is from Chalcis, circa 1400, showing a decorative fabric covering riveted to the plates. It has a fine globose brigandine with a deep skirt built of large, shaped plates. The armor of Alessandro Farnese, Duke of Parma, circa 1570. It was made by Lucio Piccinino, master armorer of the Renaissance. Elaborately decorated, this fine suit was presented to Archduke Ferdinand of the Tyrol in 1579, who kept it at Castle Ambras. The armor of Gallio de Jean Rilac, 1465-1546, distinguished member of one of the great feudal families of France, who served as a warrior under Charles VIII and was master of artillery for Louis XII and Francis I. The structural features of the Jean Rilac armor, dated 1527, indicate that it was made by an armorer who knew every trick of the art. The helmet and colleton offered complete protection for the head and every surface is curved to deflect arrow, lance and sword. The helmet also has vision slits, ample for sight yet narrow enough to prevent a weapon from entering. The helmet is reinforced with a forehead plate and a rondelle in the nape of the neck, a weak spot in the human anatomy. An Italian suit of armor circa 1470. The plates are skillfully modeled. The helmet is of a type known as a salade, introduced in Italy and Germany. The Salad helmet was elongated and pointed in the rear, normally worn with a neck and face defense called a mentonnier. The mentonnier's lower section was fastened to the breastplate and protected the neck while the hinged upper part cupped high enough to protect the chin, nose and cheekbones. A house pet, tastefully prepared for battle in 16th century armor. The helmet on this Italian suit of armor, circa 1460, is interesting because it's a barboot which lacked protection for the lower part of the face. The barboot is sometimes called the barboot salad because, like the 15th century salad, it doesn't enclose the whole head, offering most of its protection to the top. Unlike the barboot, however, the salad is often characterized by a reinforced forehead plate and an elongated pivoted nape defense. It is, however, difficult to differentiate between the barboot, the salad, and the bassinet. The shallow barboot resembles the salad, while the deep barboot resembles the bassinet. Then again, who really cares? An empty chest from the 15th century. Although the carvings on the exterior are crude, cut into the wood by someone with little talent or ability for wood carving, the chest now resides in a museum, simply because it's old. Kind of makes you stop and think, doesn't it? A painting of the Black Prince as a Fierce Baby by Ed Botticelli circa 1560. The cheap wood frame is by the Lion Decker Museum circa 1925. A rare 17th century English tapestry which tells the story of Teutonic warrior cockroaches that crossed into England from Germany and besieged the castle of Rochford on Essex. Although the cockroaches managed to storm the castle walls after a 90-day siege, the knights of the castle managed to squash the invaders when they reached the castle's inner keep. Since that great battle, the castle of Rochford-on-Essex has been free of cockroaches. 
Unfortunately, it has also been free of humans. One year after the great battle, everyone in the castle died of the plague. Shortly afterward, the castle fell into disrepair and sank into the swamp. A heraldic flag of the late 12th century decorated with fleur-de-lis. Flags existed well before the development of heraldry, but by the time that heraldry was becoming systematized, some flags were so large that they were mounted on wagons in order to be displayed and transported. The banner of the Marquess of Stafford. The motto on a scroll at the top of the flag reads, Frangus non flectes, which means, You may break, but shall not bend me. The Marquess of Stafford was considered a very stubborn and inflexible person. The banner of the Earl of Roslyn, who placed the following Latin motto over his family crest, Ileso Lumine Solem, which means, View with sight unhurt the meridian sun. After he wrote the motto for his banner, the Earl of Roslyn went blind from staring at the sun too much. The banner of the Viscount Maynard. While some mottos were battle cries or expressions of loyalty, others referred to a badge device or crest associated with the bearer's family. The motto on this flag is Manus Justa Nardus, which means, The just hand is like a precious ointment. This is a reference to the hand appearing on their coat of arms, as well as to their family name. This is one of several flags of the Baron of Winchelsea on Avon, who could never make up his mind which banner he preferred. Their family motto was Nil Consciere Sibi, which translates into English as Conscious of No Guilt. Apparently they were only guilty when they were unconscious. This unique banner which belonged to the Earl of Cholmondeley, bears the motto, Virtus Tutisi Macafis, which means, Virtue is the surest helmet. Unfortunately, the Earl didn't live very long after he came up with this motto. He lost his mind when a common foot soldier kicked him in the head after he fell off his horse. He was wearing full plate armor, except for his helmet. His friends had warned him about not wearing a helmet, but the Earl was known to be quite headstrong. Addled by the blow to his head, the Earl walked straight into the River Thames. Since plate armor doesn't float very well, the Earl of Cholmondeley immediately sank to the bottom of the river and was never seen again. In fact, he's probably still there. This striped heraldic banner belonged to Sir Orr d'Urbs, the French Baron of Beef. His family motto on the upper part of his banner was Or de Combat, which, although it sounded fierce, actually meant out of the battle. This was not a family known for its fierce warriors, although it did produce several excellent interior designers. The Earl of Carlisle's motto at the top of this flag reads, Volo non valeo, which means willing but not able. Mottos could be constantly changed or abandoned at the pleasure of the arms bearer. This banner, identified with the English Baron of Bath, shows signs of having had its motto changed several times. Some of the Baron of Bath's motto attempts translated as, Take a bath, we enjoy a hot bath, we need a bath, and don't forget to wash behind your ears. After 30 years of indecision, they finally settled on, You need a bath, which declared their view on how much the king needed the support of their family. The arm 
Commodore of Anne de Montmorency, Constable of France, won at the Battle of San Quentin in 1577. At 50 pounds it was comparatively light. This was necessary since its occupant was 64 years old. Maximilian armor from Germany, circa 1514. Very impressive. Chelsea's armor, circa 1400. This specimen is unique since surviving examples of 14th century armor are quite rare. It seems to be guarding the door. The Battle Flag of the Earl of Roslyn The Battle Flag of the Viscount Maynard One of the battle flags of the Baron of Bath, who changed his family motto several times. Translated from the Latin, some of his early mottos were Take a bath We enjoy a hot bath We need a bath and don't forget to wash behind your ears. After 30 years of indecision, the Bath family finally decided on, you need a bath, which declared their view of how much the king needed the support of their family. It's an unmarked wood door with faded flecks of white paint on it. The door is locked. When you touch the doorknob, you get a heavy coating of dust all over the palm of your hand. A sepulchral steel found in a tomb of the 6th dynasty. It tells the story of Una, born during the reign of King Tita, who served under Tita's successor Pepe. Una died during the reign of King Morena, full of days and honor. A sturdy window that looks out on the city of New York. The glass in the window is cool to the touch. Since the window is sealed shut, you're unable to open it. This is a granite steel depicting Horus and Thoth, found in the Temple of Amun-Ra. This steel was modified during the reign of the pharaoh, Akhenaten, then restored during the reign of Tutankhamun. This pyramid is a model of the Great Pyramid of Cheops, Khufu, as it appears today. Originally, the entire surface of the pyramid was covered with smooth, polished limestone. This covering has worn away over time to reveal the stepped surface we see now. The base of the Great Pyramid covers 13 acres and was built with over 2 million stones to a height of 480 feet. Construction took 30 to 50 years. The mummified corpse of Amenophis III, also known as Amenhotep III, or Memnon by the Greeks. He built large temples to Amun-Ra, both at Karnak and at Luxor. In the fifth year of his reign, Amenophis marched into Nubia to quell a mighty rebellion. He also ruled over the Mesopotamians, since his kingdom was quite large. We also know that Amenophis was a mighty hunter who slew 102 lions during the first 10 years of his reign, in his spare time. Now he's dead. It looks remarkably like a glass case in the shape of a pyramid. A small card informs you that this case contained the famous Dagger of Amon-Ra, which is now missing. Oops! Congratulations! 
You've cracked the case of the Dagger of Amon-Ra. Don't touch the sharp pieces of glass. You might cut yourself. Ironically, there's a gold Ankh medallion, the ancient Egyptian symbol of life, resting in the pool of blood. A close look reveals the initials P.S. inscribed in the back of the bloody Ankh. You pick it up and place it in your purse. There's a narrow red footprint from a woman's high-heeled shoe on the floor. Apparently the shoe's owner stepped in some of the blood. It apparently belongs to a dainty foot. identifies the slab of black basalt as the Rosetta Stone. Hieroglyphs and letters from the English alphabet are clearly engraved on the stone. The Rosetta Stone was found by a French artillery officer among the ruins of Fort Saint-Julien, near the Rosetta mouth of the Nile River, in 1799. It came into the possession of the British government after the capitulation of Alexandria. The Rosetta Stone, currently on loan to the Lion Decker Museum, is the key to modern translations of ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs into English text. You notice that half of the Rosetta Stone seems to be missing from the display, replaced by a small card that reads, Artifact 310 removed from display for research on 9126 by O.M. This placard describes the full translated text on the Rosetta Stone, which still resides in the British Museum. In summary, the text records the decree made at Canopus by the priesthood in honor of the pharaoh Ptolemy III, Euergetes I, who reigned from 247 to 222 BC. The decree discusses the great benefits which the pharaoh had conferred on Egypt and states what festivals are to be celebrated in his honor, concluding with orders that a copy of the decree, in hieroglyphics, Demotic and Greek, shall be placed in every large temple in Egypt. coffin which was contained in the exterior mummy coffin to the left. Identified from the cartouches on both coffins, the occupant was probably Hatshepsut, the female pharaoh, daughter of Thothmes I. Hatshepsut built the magnificent tomb temple at Deir el-Bari and ruled for 20 years with her lover Senmut. At her death, 
had Shepsut's successor tried to erase all memory of her by destroying her statues and obliterating her name from her various monuments. An outer mummy coffin, whose cartouches identify the occupant as Hot Shepsut, the female pharaoh, daughter of Thothmes I. The inner coffin is located to the right of this one. A mummy coffin built during the 19th dynasty. Inside and outside, both coffin and cover are decorated with large figures of gods, vignettes and inscriptions from the Book of the Dead, as well as emblems and decorations painted in bright colors. There's a pool of blood on the floor. Carter's flesh is looking rather pale, as if he's not feeling well. Perhaps it's because he's lost a lot of blood. Dr. Carter seems to have suffered a severe trauma to his chest area. There's a slight bulge in Pippin's jacket, as if he's carrying something in an inside pocket. When you reach into Pippin's tuxedo jacket, you find a notepad in his inner pocket. You pick it up and place it in your purse. The flower is fake. It has no detectable smell. A tube runs from the back of the flower, behind the lapel, down to a squeeze bulb inside the vest. When you squeeze the bulb, a weak stream of water squirts you in the eye. A close look at the dagger reveals the words, Made in Pittsburgh, stamped on the part of the blade that is not buried in Pippin Carter's chest. To your naked eye, the rough surface of the dagger handle doesn't appear to hold any fingerprints, but that's something for the coroner to examine in detail. His right eye is somewhat bloodshot, as if he's been working long hours recently in preparing the ancient Egypt exhibit for public display. No cavities in his teeth. The tongue is arched as if to say, <coughs> You're not sure if the gaping mouth means he was trying to scream, or that rigor mortis is setting in, stretching his face muscles. However, he has only been here a short time. Pippin isn't breathing, but you detect the smell of garlic on his breath. It isn't a pleasant smell. The red fluid appears to be blood. This might explain Dr. Carter's pale appearance. A close look reveals that Pippin kept his ears very clean. There are no signs of scratches or bruises on his flesh. This could mean that the murderer, assuming this wasn't a suicide, knew Dr. Carter well enough to get close and stab him without arousing any suspicion. Or it could just mean that Dr. Carter was completely taken by surprise when someone assaulted him from the shadows. You scream like a banshee, lass. Did you kill the man, then? No, I just walked in here and found him. I suppose that would explain your screaming, then. Did you see the murderer? No. All right, I'll talk to you later after you've had a chance to calm down. Just don't try to leave the building. 